For part two on this series, The Truth About Benghazi, General Tom McInerney gives a military perspective on what could have prevented that and how things went down, which is very enlightening in my opinion. I want to respond and talk about why there was no military response. Now I'll give you my experience. I was a commander in the United Kingdom before a lot of you were born when we attacked Gaddafi on April 15th, 1986. President Reagan ordered that attack. We attacked out of the United Kingdom because number one, we had the appropriate airplanes that had laser guided bombs and had the range, the F-111s, and as well as we had Margaret Thatcher. And when you have Margaret Thatcher and precision guidance bombs, you got a lot going for you. <laughs> and then Ronald Reagan. So I was delighted to be the commander of that. But I really want to relate this to you because it was a pre-planned exercise, all right? Uh, we found out on a, a Saturday that we were going to launch on a Monday. It was after La Belle Discotheque was destroyed uh, in Berlin, and we had two or three U.S. servicemen killed and several wounded, and the Brits, through their intelligence agency, told us it was Colonel Gaddafi. Now, so we had time to prepare, but let me give you a feel. We didn't have that much time. We're going to launch on a Monday. Our guidance was initially we would take 18 airplanes through France or take six airplanes the long way around through the Med. And the only reason I point this out is because I was given that guidance when I flew over and briefed the sink, General Chuck Donnelly, on a Saturday. And that night, so I had two options. That night, I was given a third option. And I told the wing commander, we only have two, said, no, we have three. And that was 18 the long way. And, and here's what I want you to understand. To do that, we had to have a very large number of tankers. It turned out we had 18 KC-10s that were brand new at the time, plus we had about uh, 18 KC-135s. Now, to do that, they had to download the PSYOP, the nuclear alert, President Reagan downloaded our nuclear alert on the bomber force and launched those tankers that were on 15-minute alert in the United States to fly into the United Kingdom. He executed that force, that tanker force, in 15 minutes, and where I was going to launch from two bases, all of a sudden I had four bases in the United Kingdom to launch from. That's my point I want to get across to you. We made that launch. We went out. It was done extremely well. We lost one aircraft, two, two crewmen, but we committed and we executed, and we didn't have a lot of time to do it. So when the President of the United States directs things to be done, they can be done. There's no question about it. Now, I met, along with the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force, every air crew that landed, took off and landed. And it shows you the flexibility that we have as leaders. Now, let's get back on point. Why did we not have a military response before? Sigonella, where we have global hawks and reapers and predators, is an Itali Italian island in the middle, about an hour from Benghazi, uh, in the middle of the Med. So we had the UAVs there, unmanned aerial vehicles, and they should have been airborne before. They should have been airborne before. We should have prepositioned F-16s from Aviano down to Sigonella to be on 15-minute alert, as Claire pointed out. Why? It was 9-11. Isn't 9-11 a significant date for us? And yet we had none of this preparation. We had all the combatant commanders back in Washington, D.C. on a commander's conference. Why would the Secretary of Defense bring all the combatant commanders on 9-11 back to the United States? So there was no pre-planning. I call that dereliction of duty. 
Next, let's go in the execution phase. All right, it happened, it happened quickly. And because we had done absolutely zero preparation, for instance, we should have had a fast team at Siganella as well, rather than being up in Bosnia, Herzegovina, I should have been down there, because that's where the action was. As Claire pointed out, Zawahiri said we must avenge the death of Al Libi. Well, Al Libi was from Libya. Where are they going to avenge the death? Not in San Bernardino. And we knew the instability that we had at Benghazi. The State Department had missed that. So we had no pre-planned activity. And then even, let's say, the start that they were given, they still could have launched F-16s. We've had to go with four tanks, no bombs. All they needed was 20 millimeter, which they always have on board, whether it's training material or uh, training weapons or uh, API, armored piercing and incendiary. No matter what it was, they, they always have that on board because it's a ballast problem. And all they had to do was launch every 30 minutes two aircraft, take off, go down, punch your tanks, make a low pass over Benghazi, come back out, land at Siganella. By then we should have had tankers. By then we should have had tankers. But nothing moved. The president said support this fight. And they did nothing. Nothing got airborne except two UAVs that were out of Siganella, that one and then followed by another. That was all we did, the most powerful military in the world. And we should have been able to at least fly by. If you go by Benghazi and go low at night, full afterburner, they don't know whether you've got laser guided bombs or what you've got. But we know from our experiences in both Afghanistan and Iraq, when you do make a low pass like that, they disappear. So we've had that combat experience. We did nothing. Now, the troubling part is no other military active duty people are getting up and saying that. They've signed non-disclosure agreements, and that means the administration to this day is terrified that the real story on Benghazi will come out about the dereliction of duty and then a cover-up. But this is bigger than Watergate. Watergate was confined to the Oval Office. This goes right to two directors of the CIA, two chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, both foremen now, two for, former Secretary of Defenses, two Secretaries of State, Attorney Generals, two of them, all have been covering this up. Never in the history of the United States have we seen a cover-up like this. And the cover-up is led none other than by who? not the administration, by our mainstream media that will not present these facts, helped by our Congress. I respect Trey Gowdy, but I'm very worried that that report that he put out, and Chuck explained maybe the, the method of his madness, but the fact is, is he should have come up with some conclusions. Now, we can read an 800-page report and come up with conclusions if you can get through page eight. So we're humans. So the American people want to know, for a group that spent almost two years on it, what the conclusions were. That's what we pay you for, Mr. Gowdy. All right. So we had dereliction of duty by the president, the vice president, the National Security Council, SEC State, SEC DEF, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the combatant commanders, etc. I know this because one month after this happened, a young Navy lieutenant approached me at the golf course at Army Navy and didn't, wouldn't give me his name. He said, keep doing what you're doing, General. I was in the Situation Room that night. And has anybody seen a picture of the President and his national security team on the front page of the Wall Street Journal like we have for when he took Osama bin Laden down. Where was the president? And that complicit media, that complicit media 
is doing a great, great injustice against the United States of America. Charles, thank you very much for being here. God bless you. God bless you all for being here.